Okay, so it's been a little while since I last recorded anything with Flight Sim, so I thought I'd come in today, I'm spending my lunchtime from work recording this. We're going to fly a CRJ around a circuit of um, Stansted in North London. So let's go inside the aircraft and see how we get a CRJ up and running and then how we program the flight plan and how we get on with it. So first things first, we need to go and turn the battery on. So up here there's two switches, there's DC service and battery master. DC service is the external power if it's available. I haven't connected it, I'm going to do this without it. So we switch on the battery master switch and you can see lights come on all over the cockpit. And the next thing we'll do is go and switch on the IRS alignment so if we switch the IRS switches down here, whoops, that was the parking brake, switch the IRS switches to nav. Obviously in the real aircraft um, I've gone into the tablet, there's a tablet here that's worth pointing out. If we just power it up, there's lots of options in here and I have configured the IRS system to align itself instantly. So doing the IRS first isn't such a, an important thing, but I'm doing it anyway because that would be the normal thing you'd head for first. So the very next thing you would do after setting the IRS to align is go up to the APU panel. And we will hit the power fuel button first, which is there. Let's just zoom in slightly so we can see that. And if we go and look outside the aircraft, if we go and look at the back, you can see there is a panel opening up. And if we also look on the status display down here, you can see APU SOV open. So that's the inlet for the APU. So then once that's opened, we can hit the start button for the APU and it will slowly power up. So you will see the screens come on in a few moments with more information. We can also go on the ECAM buttons down here and click on electricity or electrical and you can see the status of the electrical systems and one of those obviously is the APU so you'll see it giving a voltage in a few moments and you can also see on here a whole raft of things page one of two um, of issues with the aircraft at the moment so obviously as we configure things these lights will go out so just while we're waiting for the APU let's go and have a look at Little Nav Map so we are sitting at Stansted Airport on the edge of London. We're going to fly down to Ekveg, Evnas, Brain, Totvo, and then back into Stansted. So you can see Stansted is at 340 feet altitude. Let's turn off the centering there so we can keep this big. Uh, we're at 340, so we'll go for about 3,000 feet on the way around the circuit, which will put us in a good place to come into the ILS. Okay, so if we come back into the aircraft, we can see now we've got the APU up and running so we can carry on with the rest of our procedures. So, after switching on the APU, we can start configuring things like the yaw dampers, which are here. We can turn on the stab stabulator trim. We can turn on the MAC trim. Um, and then we can go up and turn on the windscreen heating, which is up here. We turn both left and right windows to low. We can to arm the emergency lights. Um, then on the fuel panel, we can go and switch on the boost pumps. So there's the left boost pump and the right boost pump for the engines. And then we can do the pushback at this point. So before we do the pushback, we need to go and look in the tablet. And we need to remove the chocks otherwise they won't be able to push back. Also we need to come down here and undo the wheel brakes or the parking brake I should say. So if we press shift P in the simulator we get to watch the truck line up on us and push us back. So it's quite amusing watching these trucks isn't it? Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. This one's getting it a little bit wrong so it'll probably adjust at the, the last moment to line up with the aircraft. And they don't always fit the aircraft either, so it's better than nothing though. Okay, so what's it looking like in around the airport? The weather looks pretty atrocious, doesn't it? But it'd be quite good actually if we do get um, limited visibility on approach. Somebody just landed over the top of somebody else, that didn't look very legal to me. 
I'm presuming that's a human. I haven't got labels on, so I don't know. I'm presuming that looked like a robot, and that's possibly a human, so we'll see. I wonder if we'll get there before they've left. So we're just completing the pushback. While we're doing the pushback, we can get ready and advance the throttles to idle. We haven't started the engines yet, remember, but they won't start unless they are advanced. OK, how are we looking? Have we got enough room to turn yet? We'll go out into the middle, and then we'll release the truck. You can get a plug-in that makes it very easy to steer your pushback, and I haven't got it installed, so sorry about that. So press Shift P. Or a mod, I should say, not a plug-in. OK, so the truck is now leaving us. So the next thing we'll do is go and start the engines. So we look back in the panel overhead, and you've got the starters for the left and right engines here. So they'll start coming up. If you look on this display down here, you can see the N2 number, the gas turbine numbers coming up. Then the temperatures will raise, and then the N1 numbers, the turbofans, will start to speed up as well. And you'll start to see the, the various is issues disappearing on the screen. If we put the, the main status screen back on, you'll start to see these reflecting what's going on as well. OK, so we just give it a moment for the engines to come up. They've gone past 24%. If you didn't advance the throttles, they'd stick at 24%, because that's the maximum the APU can drive them round at. Obviously, now they've ignited, the temperature's come up, and they're properly spinning up. It's a bit like kind of... Starting a jet engine is a bit like lifting it by its own kind of coattails into the air. It's, um, it's interesting. OK, so you can see things are starting to stabilise, which is good. So the next thing we'll do is go and switch off the APU. Now we don't need it because electricity is automatically cross-fed across to the engines now. So we can switch off the APU and switch close that panel. So if we go and look at the back of the aircraft, you can see this little panel is busy closing itself. OK, hydraulics panel is here. We want to switch everything to auto. Nose wheel steering. We won't be able to steer the aeroplane unless we arm the nose wheel steering. It's over here. We're getting there. And external lights. So let's go and have a look. We want nav lights on, beacon on, strobe on. We'll put the logo on as well so people can see who we are. It's quite nice. We haven't programmed the flight plan yet. So it's a bit out of the ordinary to do this so late, but we'll go and do it now just while we're sat in the middle of the taxiway stopping all the other traffic. So position initialization. Airport EGSS. Normally you would do this before engines start, so while you're still sat there, before you're letting passengers on or anything like that. Um, oh, sorry, we need to pick up this value and drop it into set position. Then we go to flight plan. We can go EGSS. SS. We're going back to EGSS. That's the code for Stansted, by the way. And we can go to Performance Initialization. I'm not going to fill everything out. Not today. 3,000 feet in the cruise altitude. Uh, we don't really want... Don't worry about the fuel. We can put in 5,000. It really doesn't matter. I think that the stock fuel it puts in the aircraft for you in the simulators around about that. But we're not going to bother. Um, OK, so let's go and look in the legs page. So we're going to have to go and program our legs manually. So ekveg, E-K-V-E-G. We put in there. The next one is evnas. So E-V-N-A-S. Drop that in. Next one is brain. B-R-A-I-N. Put that in there, and it's giving us the option of two, and you can see the closer one is only 15 miles away, the other was 3,600 miles away, so it's obviously the top one. And then TOTVO is the last waypoint, T-O-T-V-O. And execute that, and so you can see on the display here the plan has suddenly appeared out of nowhere, which is great. We still haven't said what our approach will be, so we can go to Depart, so this is the 
departing on runway 22 and we can execute that and we can come back out of here and we can say arriving on runway ILS for runway 22 and we can execute that and it's completed the whole circuit around now we need to go back and look in the legs page and see if there are any discrepancies so next page the, oh, sorry discontinuity sorry not discrepancy what I'm talking about so we can delete this discrepancy uh, discontinuity <laughs> having problems talking today um, you can see there's some vectors here and there we could actually delete those because we we got a very simple plan it's not going to be a, of concern so if we go previous page we can there's no vectors there so execute that and you can see now if we go and zoom in so there's a knob over here that zooms us in we can see the flight plan really clearly okay so just before we do get going let's go and set our initial heading so if we zoom in so we can see this screen as well oh let's just check as well yeah all of the warnings have gone off you can see the packs are off we haven't done the air conditioning so we can turn the packs on we can turn the recirculation fan on as well so that will get rid of those warnings we can also put the slats and flaps to take off positions so just using my stick to do that um, what was I oh yes I was going to go and program the master control panel for the autopilot before we get anywhere near the runway so let's go and set our target heading if we were going to fly heading mode so this is really doubling up from what we need to do so we know it's runway 22 so we'll put in 22 I think it's 225 is the actual yeah 225 is the actual direction so 22 I'm look I'm watching this number down here by the way 225 is on the heading and we can put this into heading mode already and we could say the altitude we want to climb to is not 10,000 we're looking at this number here now we want to climb to 3000 and we'll put it into vertical speed mode to get there and we'll climb out at two and a half thousand feet a minute oh, actually it's three thousand feet a minute be good okay so it's when we leave the runway if we have the autopilot configured we're going to hit nav mode as soon as we take off but we'll go for heading and vertical speed just to get us off the ground uh, we could also use speed mode of course so if we go and look at speed you can see it's only got 40 knots written down here we'll have a play with that on the way around possibly but you basically you can set your speed in this aircraft and if speed mode is engaged it will match the climb rate at the thrust you have already set to do the speed but I doubt we'll use it but we'll configure it anyway just in case okay oh something about else we could do at this point before we come back in later I'm not sure of course will have yeah course won't reflect anything because we're not using we're using FMS mode not localizer mode so if we're in localizer mode later on you'll see the course come into play okay let's get rolling so let's advance the throttles gently give it some rudder and let's go and get on the runway Gently taxi out. So just do some double checks. The flaps are in the right positions. Flight plan's configured with no discontinuities. The master control panel has been programmed for the autopilot. So we're looking good so far. It looks like the rain is stopping, which is great. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has advised that we are now cleared for takeoff. OK, 
Okay. We will be looking as we advance the throttle for Marcus to appear at the top of the primary flight, flight display to um, indicate what throttle mode we're in. So this has kind of a Fardex throttle system where it has various detents, a little bit like an Airbus throttle. So we'll be looking for Toga. Max power is beyond Toga. So let's start rolling straight away. So we got so you can see a climb, and there we go, we've got Toga power. If we push it past Toga power, it goes to max. So we just go to Toga. So we're looking at the speeds on the indicated airspeed strip. So we will rotate at about 140 knots. Just hold it steady. Gear up. As we accelerate through towards 200 knots, we'll raise the flaps. And we will engage the autopilot. So you can see autopilot engage here. So it's going to do exactly what we told it. At this point we'll go for nav mode, which will take over, so instead of doing a, a straightforward heading, it's now going to fly for ECVEG. Okay, so you can see ECVEG is 16 miles away. We're coming, well, need to pull off the speed, over sped, people who know me will start laughing at that point. Because we're below 10,000 feet, we have to stay 250 knots or slower, so I'm just pulling the throttle back. Something else we didn't do while we were on the ground is set the barometric pressure. But it looks like it's it was slightly lower. So I should have done that before I took off, so my bad. Thankfully I'm not a real pilot. Just messing around with simulators, but there you go. So I pressed B to do that, by the way. It works a little bit strangely in the CRJ. It's the, the B key seems to toggle between setting the accurate uh, barometric pressure or going to standard, which is 2992. Or so, yeah, it seems to work a little bit differently than some of the other aircraft, where B will just repeatedly re-measure the barometric pressure for you. So we're doing 250 knots. We're creeping up slowly, so I'm going to come off the throttle a little bit. So we're coming up, we're just approaching 3,000 feet, so the plane's going to level itself out. That's why you could see the Alt-S indicator flashing, because you're approaching the, the target altitude. And you can see it switched over automatically from vertical speed mode to altitude hold mode. So it did that on its own. So now we're in nav mode, so it's following the FMC route. So we should get a left turn anytime soon. Should we go outside to have a look? And there goes the left turn. Okay, so it's a, a cloudy day over London. This is live weather, so it is it does actually reflect what's what I'm looking at outside the window. I live about half an hour from the edge of London. And it's yeah, it's pretty awful outside. It's a dark, miserable day. Okay, so at this point we're just going to fly around the route, so I'm going to pause the video until we're coming in for the final turn towards the ILS, because this is going to be very boring to watch an aeroplane doing 250 knots for the next 20 minutes or so. So I'll catch up in a moment. Okay, so rather than... I'm just wondering if this is still recording, just checking, yes it is recording. So we're back in the aircraft. Rather than let the aircraft have all the fun of doing the approach, we can see now, if we look down on the screen, we are approaching Totsvo and we're going to make the turn into the ILS. So we're going to double check little nav map and make sure we're going to look at the ILS for runway 22, which is 110.50. And we'll just go and double check. We're looking at the radio screen in the FMC and we've got 110.50 on nav 1, which is perfect. So we're just coming up to the turn, and it may be, actually, rather than let the aircraft have all the fun of doing the approach, shall we fly it ourselves? 
So we're going to come off the throttle a little bit and start decelerating. We're coming back then towards 220 knots. We'll disengage the autopilot at this point. So you click the button there. And start watching the instruments. So we're at 3,000 feet. Let's just... We're just slowly descending. Let's zoom this in a little bit further so we can see where we are. So what we're also going to do, before we get to the turn... Oh, we're being pushed around by the wind a little bit, which is quite interesting. We're, we're also going to change the nav source to use localizer 1. We know we're tuned in, so this is now pointing at the, the runway. So the course now on here should reflect... Yeah, so you can see 222 is showing there. So if we just go and remind ourselves, looking at this little nav map, the actual course of the runway is 222 degrees, which is perfect. OK, so we're going to start our turn. So we can see, looking at the instruments here, if I just tee the screen up. So we're going to overshoot slightly, which isn't a problem. So we're coming down the speed, so I'm going to start putting the flaps out. quite a long way until we get there, so it's not a big problem. So we're just watching the artificial horizon, watching the height. So we'll just straighten up at about 210 degrees. So we're heading into the wind now. And you'll see the horizontal part of the ILS beam is straightening up. You know, we're crossing back over it, which you can see on the map display to the left. Slightly over speeding. Just correct that. The aircraft doesn't want to lose any speed, which is interesting. Right, that's better. Okay, there's another aircraft there on approach. We follow them in. So, gear down interesting trying to do this one hand flying while also doing everything else. So landing lights on. Turbulence is throwing me around a little bit. It's a bit bumpy up here today. Flaps down another notch. So what we're actually watching here is the little green dot, which is the ILS beam. So he's coming in very shallow compared to us. So we're going to pretty much follow him in, which is fine. So we're not really looking outside at this point, we're just watching the instruments. So we're looking to get on the green dot in the middle of this line, which is the, the vertical component of the ILS, and get this line into the middle of here, which is the horizontal component. So we're roughly in the ballpark. We can zoom this in a bit further, so we get a much nicer look at it. So we're going a little bit fast, so we come off the throttle. We're off to the left, so we'll turn right. Pull that back into the middle. A little bit high. So we drop the nose gently. Pull the nose back up to stop our descent. So again, I f following an ILS in is really just about methodical changes. Drop another level of flaps, and you're starting to see lights out in front of us now for the runway, which is good. A little bit high. Yeah, I always prefer landing manually. It's much more fun than letting the autopilot do everything. So it looks like we're diving, but actually it's just because the view I had the view centered on the instruments so you could see them. Two 
200. Center line, but not a big problem. Okay, so we'll just roll out, raising the flaps as we go, pull off the runway. So, I actually think the CRJ is incredibly easy to fly, it's very similar in many respects to the CJ4, which comes with Microsoft Flight Simulator. So if you're not familiar with CRJ, you might know it by the company name that used to make them, which is Bombardier. Um, it's used by lots of commuter routes around Europe. Please remain seated until the aircraft has come to a complete stop. <laughs> There's all sorts of nice tricks or nice touches like the um, the passenger announcements. As you can see, the weather in Stansted today is pretty horrible. Anyway, I'm sure you don't really want to watch somebody switching everything back off again, because that's pretty straightforward, you know, you just do reverse order of what we did when we got in. So I'm going to stop the video there. But yeah, this was the CRJ in Microsoft Flight Simulator, doing a quick tour of Stansted. And we took it, obviously, from cold and dark on the ground and switched things on, and had a look around the cockpit along the way. Um, if you want to come and fly online with a whole group of people, I help run a website called virtualflight.online. So if you go and have a look on the internet, we have a Discord server and a Facebook group. And the Discord server, we use that for voice comms during group flights. We meet up roughly a couple of times a week, usually on Wednesday nights and Friday nights, British summer time. So I guess that would be early afternoon for the Sunday nights. I, I did say Sunday, didn't I? Not Saturday. So Wednesday and Sunday nights. Um, Wednesday night tends to be an instrument flight, so, you know, big jets s somewhere in the world. And flights usually about an hour and a half. And Sunday night is a VFR flight, so general aviation aircraft, usually flying around, you know, mountains around Switzerland or New Zealand or so, uh, anywhere of interest, really. We've just recently been flying around Germany. So, yes, if you want to come and fly along with a whole group of people and just have a relaxed chat and learn about the simulator and find out what other everybody else is flying and what they've learned that week it's a great way of catching up with everybody that have the same interest as you so virtualflight.online go and check it out on the internet anyway i'm going to stop the video there so we'll see you again soon